there was a philosophy professor who read a headlines <clears throat> um, from a newspaper to his philosophy class. He said, the Bible is the word of God because it claims to be the word of God. The Bible is the word of God because it claims to be the word of God. Now he went on to say, that is a perfect example of circular reasoning. Christians simply assume that the, the point they wish to prove. Now what, what had happened here? He had grabbed a hold of a headline and had brought it to his class and showed the Christians there this headline to basically say that as Christians you really take your mind you know, out of your head and you kind of put it on, on the shelf. You commit intellectual suicide. Because he went on to say that's tantamount, such statement is tantamount to saying I'm telling you the truth because I'm telling you that I'm telling you the truth. Now, is the professor wrong completely? I, I mean, we all know what it is and how naive it is when someone says, or when we ask someone, why need you believe that stranger? And the person says, I believe them because they, they told me they were telling me the truth. I mean, those kind of people, we want to say, look, we, we've got some beachfront property in, in Arizona we'd like to sell you, right? And we, we know how also some people are so naive to say, or to expect us to believe anything they say without the confirmation of that, of what they may say. So, is the professor completely wrong? The statement by itself that the Word of God claims to be the Word of God, at least to the natural mind, is suspect. I'll give him that. I mean, again, uh, you know, do you believe everything you hear or read? No. And we know everything you read on the internet is not true. So, how do we know that the Bible's claim of uh, being the Word of God is indeed true? So he, he raises a good point. But there's a couple points, at least one vital point, that I think he leaves out. Let's assume that someone arrived on the shores of Georgia, and before we would invite them into our social circle, welcome them wherever, we would want to know a bit about their background, about their nationality, and, and, and perhaps some other things. In fact, we might even commission some people to do an investigation of the clothing that he's wearing, his facial features, and perhaps even the boat that he arrived upon uh, in. So, in that sense, we would, we would certainly want to know something. But, assuming that he could speak our language, and, uh, or if he can't speak our language, assuming that there would be an interpreter there to give us definition and clarity as to what he's saying, we would certainly say that he has the right to say, to give, uh, tell us, or we, ha we have the right to interview him. We should, in fact, inter interview him, right? I mean, we know that a person, you can do, uh, you can do a study and research on a person uh, for months and for years, and you may not find out what they may say to you just in a moment of an interview. In fact, we can even take it a step further. Um, uh, uh, someone in a court of law, a defendant in a court of law, has the right to defend himself, does he not? I mean, he has the right to s defend and give us a reason as to why he is innocent. Now, he won't say... I'm innocent because I told you I'm innocent. That, how far would that go? Not very far. But he'll say, I'm innocent because of this. He has the right to defend himself. Now, cross-examination will verify whether he's telling us the truth. But in the beginning, he has the right to be interviewed. And, and at that moment, we presume, unless we know otherwise, we presume that in interviewing him that he's telling us the truth, right? Until we can verify whatever he's told us. So, that defendant might be telling us the truth. 
the Word of God might be telling us the truth by its very words. You see, that's where we begin in this series. We're going to begin with the Bible in its own words. Does it tell us that it is divinely inspired? Does, does it tell us that it is God's directive word to us? Now, in previous, in, in coming weeks, we're going to look at a prophetic reason as to why we can believe and trust the word. We will look at a scientific reason. Uh, the Bible, by the way, is not a scientific book. But when it speaks in the area, area of science, it is always, always correct. I'm going to show you that. The Bible is not a history book. But when it speaks in the area of history, it's always correct. We're going to look at it from a historical standpoint. We'll look at it from a providential uh, proof. And that is, how did we get the Bible? And by the way, we will answer the question, is the King James the only reliable translation that we have. Someone asked me to do that. And so we're going to look at that as well. And so I need to say something here. Normally what we do is we do expository preaching. That is we take a text, we tear it apart, and we explain it. And we're going to do some of that today. But by the very nature of this series, we won't be able to do that every week because we'll be looking at many, many different passages. So I just want to say that up front here that um, we'll get back to that. That's my great love, my first love. But we, to, by the very nature of this series, uh, we can't do that every Sunday. But let's look in, in terms of the Bible in its own words. Now, arguably, the greatest attack on the Bible will come in the area, and you've heard it, I'm sure, uh, from those who would say, how can you trust the Bible? Because the Bible was, was written by human authors, Right? That's true. True. So how can you believe? It? Surely they're, they're simply human. So how, do you, how, how can you trust that? And the answer up front has to do with the Bible was not written by simply men. It had a dual authorship. It had a dual authorship. And I'm going to try to sh explain this to you in a, perhaps a different way than you've ever heard before. Maybe you have. But uh, let's begin first with the incarnation of Christ. You see, just as the humanity of Christ has been a stumbling block to those who deny the deity of Christ, so has the humanity of the Bible been a stumbling block to those who deny its divine authorship. Consider the similarities between Christ, the, in, the incarnated Christ who came here on the earth, and the Word of God. For example, their eternality. In other words, the fact that they are for eternity. John 1.1. 1, 1. We have the verses listed. You might want to make... Uh, there they are. Uh, there's one. In the beginning was the Word... And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, Christ is referred to as the Word, the Lagos, the rationale. The, phil the philosophers of, the, of that day the, would wax eloquently about the Lagos, the, the rationale, the manifestation, and they, they talk, come up with all these cool ideas. And said, man, this is... And, and, and John said, hey, you want to know about that Lagos? That stuff you wax eloquently about, nobody really knows what you're saying. He says it's come in the flesh. The reality of life has come in the flesh. That's the logos, the rationale. But the word, look at the word. Psalm 119, 89 says, Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. What was it saying? It was saying God's word is eternal in nature. Someone said it, and they said it well. They said, there are only two things that last for eternity. Souls of men and the Word of God. That's true. Look at the similarity in terms of it be, both being conceived by the Holy Spirit. Luke one thirty five says, The angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. How was the Holy, the Holy Child conceived? Conceived by the Holy Spirit in the womb of Mary. 
In 2 Peter, and we're going to get to this passage later, chapter 1, verse 21 says, For no prophecy has ever been, ever, uh, was ever made by an act of human will. But men, watch this, moved by the Holy Spirit, spoke from God. Consider the fact that both were human and yet without sin, without error. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, it says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are and yet without sin. And then in John 10, 35, speaking of the Word of God, it says, If he called them gods to whom the Word of God came, and the Scripture cannot be broken. In other words, there cannot be a lie. There cannot be an untruth in the Word of God. Consider the fact that, that in Revelation chapter 19, it states, speaking of Christ, as he comes back the second time, he is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. <clears throat> Great parallels between Christ and the Word of God. Now, just as it is difficult sometimes to explain the incarnation of Christ, that is of Christ taking on human flesh, it is also difficult at times to explain the dual authorship of the Word of God. Can it be explained? It certainly, and we're going to do that today. But let me make this statement. Whatever I do today, and however I may explain this in, in the coming weeks, we cannot take out the element of faith that is needed by all of us. Now, when I say that, I, I say it somewhat to my disdain because there's a part of me that, I, that cannot stand to hear believers say, when you ask them why they believe something, they say, you just got to have faith, which really means they can't explain to you why they believe what they believe. That's not what, what I'm saying, but what I don't want to do is to imply in any way that we can take out the element of faith. Faith has to be in it. <clears throat> and again, when you begin to explain the dual authorship, it begins with a comparison of Christ and his humanity. And, and there you go. On the left-hand side, you have the God-man, the Christ. That's, that's known if you want to... Keep a, remember a big theological word that's called the, the hypostatic union. Sounds like something that goes under your car, doesn't it? Uh, the hypostatic union, that is that Christ was human and he was divine. You say, well, how did that work? Here's how it worked. Christ, while he walked here on this earth, was in total dependence, as far as exercising his divine side, on the Father. He never exercised his divine attributes without his father's allowing him to do so. That's what it means in Philippians chapter 2, which is known as the kenosis, when it says he emptied himself of his divine being, basically. It didn't mean he completely emptied. He simply put it aside until the father allowed him to use it. Now, you, you flip over to the other side. You have human authorship and you have divine authorship. They're interconnected. And so sometimes when we look at this whole discussion about um, the human authors, we fail to realize that there was a dual authorship. Don't let, let anyone tell you it was simply written by men. No, it was men were tools, but it was not solely written by men. So what does divine inspiration mean? What does it not mean? Well, Divine inspiration doesn't mean simply that the Word of God was without error in the original manuscripts. Now, I know some will ask the question, what do you mean original manuscripts? When we talk about the Bible being inspired, we're talking about in the original manuscripts, the Hebrew and Greek manuscripts. We're not talking about this book, King James or the New American Standard or any other, being without error. We hope that they're correct. But we're talking, when we talk about God writing through men, we're talking about the original manuscripts. In short, the Bible is God's authority. It's more than just a book without error. 
And so the question that here for us is, is what we have true? Does it come with God's autograph, God's signature? Or has man fouled up the works and therefore what we have today is a flawed version or translation? That's what we're going to answer today. Now some will say that the Bible is inspired in matters of doctrine, but in other matters it's not inspired or it may not be inspired. Some will say that it's inspired when pointing to Christ, but it may contain contradictions and errors in matters of lesser importance. Some say that it's inspired very much like someone is inspired by watching a sunset uh, somewhere. Maybe the, if, you're in, if you live in California, you watch the sunset on the Pacific Ocean and there's nothing that, that's more, you know, just wonderful than seeing that sunset. But that's kind of what they say. The, the Bible becomes the Word of God when you are inspired, moved, in other words, you have this epiphany, so to speak, then it becomes the Word of God. Now, think about that. That kind of thinking is gravely wrong, is it not? I mean, how can you, the Bible be inspired in matters of doctrine and teachings that are vital in the Bible and be incorrect in other areas? I mean, how many of you have grown up with someone or some people that you know, they were known for not telling you the truth or known for expanding or exaggerating the truth. Anybody have any of those people? I had a few of those. And before long, you, you, you don't know what to believe, right? We had a guy in our, our speech class in, in high school named Morris, and he was always telling these big stories. And one day he came in and said, well, this weekend a couple of us guys broke into the zoo and, and, and uh, stole this alligator. So, man, I tell you, he's really, he's really told a whopper this time. Well, sure enough, on the front page of the paper that afternoon, alligator tied back to the front gate of the zoo. They'd taken it back after driving through Shoney's several times with it in his trunk. They'd taken it back. Well, I, I didn't believe him. So how can you believe part of it and not believe the other part? And then what part do you believe? See, it all comes down to the question of dual authorship. How could God use human beings and yet that which you wrote down is without error? Many people interpret divine inspiration as the fact that they would say God simply dictated his word and the authors, human authors, wrote down what was dictated to them. But anyone who understands Hebrew, who has a knowledge of Hebrew or Greek, will tell you that in reading the Greek text or the Hebrew text, clearly you can see the difference in the authors. They all have a different literary style. They have a different vocabulary. I, I could spend uh, probably a class on the difference between the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Peter, whoever wrote the book of Hebrews, Mark. They all are, are different and their personalities came through. But nonetheless, in all of it, God was the overseer of the writing down of his word. I'm going to give you another word in a few moments. Let's go to a couple passages that were read earlier. 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. It's a familiar passage. We all, many of us know it, but I want us to go back to it again. In 2 Timothy chapter 3. And when you get there, join me at verse 16 and 17. Now, in this context, what's happened is that the Apostle Paul, last, writing his last book, last letter, tells Timothy to continue in the things that he had learned. From whom? From his mother and his grandmother. And the major portion of that was to remember what you had learned concerning, now watch this, the sacred writings. The sacred writings. Now, let's read beginning verse 16. All scripture is inspired by God, profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, 
so that, purpose clause, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped in every good word. Now let's begin from the beginning. All, that word could be translated uh, every. Both will give you a different flavoring. All speaks more of all-inclusive. Every speaks more of individual words, but they still, you, you still arrive at the same train station when it's all said and done. He says every bit of the word is inspired. All scripture is inspired. Now, we need to understand what the word scripture means from what Paul is saying. The word scripture simply means that which is written down or a writing. Among the Jews, they knew it to speak, they actually as it progressed, it came to mean sacred writings. And so when the Apostle Paul says all scripture is inspired of God, he's referring to the Old Testament canon of scripture that had been com compiled and collected long before Paul came along. You say, well, is he saying that the New Testament, or is he implying that the New Testament was not inspired by God? No, not at all. In fact, there are many good reasons to understand that when he says sacred writings or scripture, he's referring to the New Testament as being inspired as well. If I say all rain is wet, I don't mean that all the rain up to that point is wet or moist. I mean all rain, anything that falls into the category of rain. And clearly, there's evidence that during the New Testament time, some Christians, uh, many Christians, refer to the New Testament as the Scripture. For example, on one occasion, the Apostle Peter referred to something that the Apostle Paul said, and he said, referred to it in the sense, he said, as the rest of Scripture. As the rest of Scripture. So he was including what Paul said with the Old Testament scripture. Now, the Apostle Peter also said to his people at the time that you should remember the words spoken beforehand, and watch this, by the holy prophets. Who are the holy prophets? Old Testament prophets. By the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior spoken by your apostles. Who is he referring to there? New Testament writers. Clearly, the New Testament writers considered their writings on par with the Old Testament writers. But what does it mean, inspired by God? Well, we know the word inspired. Some of us know that it means God breathed. But what does that mean? I mean, uh, for I confess there were a few years that I had a problem with that. How do you wrap your mind around God breathing being the word of God? And then it finally dawned on me. The word God, the phrase God breathed is a, 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 a Jewish idiom. What's an idiom? A, a idiom is a s form of expression, a cliche we would call it. Something that was used, uh, known to a group of people or a generation of people. And so God breathing was often used. For example... It says by the, in Psalm 33, 6, it says, By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth all their host. By the breath of his mouth all their host. In jo Job, uh, verse 33, uh, chapter 33, verse 4, it says, The Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. Now I can read several other passages in which that phrase is used. But the idea is of just how mighty and, and great and sovereign God is. He is so great, so mighty, so sovereign that it, he brings life into this universe. He gives this, makes this universe. He gives life to individuals and he gives life to his word simply by his breath. Sometimes we make the statement, ha. Sometimes when people are kind of razzing each other, and someone will say to the other, I could blow on you and blow you away. What do we, what do we mean by that? We're meaning that that person's weak compared to us. Well, flip the analogy there, and you've got the, the point here. 
God is so strong, all he has to do is just, as a figure of speech, just breathe. Now, think about that. If God, God the Son, can take on flesh and yet be without sin, is it that big of a deal to believe that God can also so govern and oversee and superintend the writing down of his word that it would be without error? I mean, is that that hard to understand? Go with me to Second Peter now. Second Peter chapter 1. Now, in Second Timothy, what we just read, the Apostle Paul discloses the true nature of the Word of God, its divine origin. When we get to Second Peter, he gives us the process by which that comes about. And this is key here. And, and we're going to break this passage apart because there are some words here that can be somewhat misleading. In chapter 1 of 2 Peter, it says, But know this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit. Now, the first thing I want you to see is the word interpretation. We're going to have to kind of redefine some of these words so you can better understand this passage. When you think of interpretation, you think of somehow giving the meaning of a passage. That's not what this word means. The word means the unfolding or the literally unloosing of a portion of Scripture. So it says, know this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's on loosing. In other words, he's speaking of the fact that Scripture did not come to us or did not originate in any prophet, anyone who spoke on behalf of God. That's the idea. That's the meaning behind this passage. In fact, uh, when you get to the word prophecy, for example, that's misleading as well. Because when we read prophecy, we think of foretelling the future. And so we, we, when you put these together, some people say, well, this means that the interpretation of it, or that it's speaking of the interpretation of prophecy. Not so. It's not speaking of the interpretation of prophecy in terms of the future. No, the word prophecy in its root meaning means to speak forth or to forth tell. Foretelling is a secondary meaning of the word. Jeremiah gives us a good example of that because when God called upon Jeremiah to speak on his behalf, Jeremiah, like Moses, said, I'm inadequate. I'm not, I can't do that. And so in Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 7 through 9, our Lord essentially said, All that I command you, you shall speak. I have put my words in your mouth, is essentially what our Lord said. I'm not reading the whole verse. But that's the idea. I put my words in your mouth. And later on, Jeremiah described a prophet when he said, a prophet is basically one who has stood in the counsel of God, face to face with God, and therefore he is now to take what he's learned and he is to, watch this, announce it to his people. Forth telling, announcing. That's what he means here. So let's put it back together here. But know this, first of all, that no forth telling of Scripture is a matter of one's un own unfolding. It didn't originate with that person. Let's move on, though. What else is it saying? For no prophecy, again, here it is again, forever was ever made by the act of human will. In other words, he's saying it didn't originate from the, the prophet. Nor was, it, nor was it something that he did on his own, that he all of a sudden decided that he wanted to do something, wanted to say something on God's behalf. Sometimes we, when we interpret Scripture, we're tempted to say more than the text says. I had a great pastor one day, he said, Byron, make sure that you distinguish between what thus saith the Lord is and what you think it is. And so 
uh, he's saying this is not of human will here. But what does he say? But men, men, prophets, preachers, teachers in that day, moved by the Holy Spirit, spoke from God. Moved by the Holy Spirit. Now again, the word moved means to be carried along or to come along or born along. The Greeks understood this word because it was often used in the context of a ship that was being blown by the, by the wind as the wind would blow its sails and move that ship along. And so what this is saying is that men only spoke as God moved them along and directed them. Not of their own accord. That's the key word. The key word here is that God so superintended. I, uh, my brother, one of my brothers was an uh, engineer for the Corps of Engineers in Vicksburg, Mississippi. And their job was to make sure that the mighty Mississippi stayed within its bounds. Uh, that was their job. And by the way, if you've never done this, you need to stop in Vicksburg. Stop if you ever go that way. And find one of those fish houses up on, kind of on the side of the river. And just eat all the catfish and hush puppies you can eat. And just watch the mighty Mississippi. And once you do, you get a sense that this thing is so powerful. And it is so powerful because it will not stay within its banks unless something is done. In fact, if you go back to a study, you can see how it has taken many different courses over time. Well, how do you keep the river within its boundary? Well, the interesting thing about my brother, James, is that James, before he graduated with a civil engineer degree, he worked on the river on a barge that put down things, these giant mats made of cement plates, down the river. That's how he put himself through college. And so they do that in order to superintend the river. Now, sometimes they're not successful. But they keep that river on its course. Our Lord superintends, or superintended, the writing of his word so that what was written down was what he intended to be written down. In fact, let me give you the formal definition of inspiration, divine inspiration. God so directed the human authors that without destroying their individuality or literary style, his complete and connected thought towards man was recorded. His complete and connected thought was recorded. And here's the point. God so superintended that not only what he wanted to have written down was written down, but he even uses the, used the personalities of different writers, but even when they spoke or wrote down, he so and superintended what was being written down, watch this, to the very word that was used. Now the authors, had, some of them had more of a vocabulary than others, but nonetheless, what was written down was indeed what God intended to be written down. It's what we call plenary inspiration, down to the very word. Now, what about other in, in, internal proofs? Uh, what are there other proofs in the Bible that communicate to us that God has spoken to us today? Listen, I, I said this in, in this weekend, and I sent out, I made this comment. The greatest battle today, the greatest issue today, may surprise you. It's not the proliferation of, of porno pornography. It's not homosexuality. It's not, and you can put anything you, abortion. Those are, those are critical issues that we need to face and we need to stand against them. But listen, here's the, the, the critical issue of our day. Has God spoken to us? Has God spoken to us? Has he really spoken to us? And if he has, has he given us a standard by which we are to live? Because relativism says today, we want to make our own truth. 
We want to believe what we want to believe. Truth becomes our truth as we believe it. You want to believe Ronald McDonald is your savior? That's fine. That's fine. That's, that's cool if that's what you want to believe. Just don't bother me with your truth. And don't bother me with the truth that God says that Christ is the Savior. And so the question, the biggest issue, the biggest battle today, folks, is whether or not God has spoken. That's why I'm so passionate about us believing this word and believing for what it says. Now, what about it? It was a famous Swedish movie director, Ingemar uh, Bergman, who stood in a cathedral in Europe by a painting of Christ, and he said, whispered, speak to me, speak to me. And of course, you know, he didn't hear any sound. That became the impetus for the movie he directed entitled simply, Silence. And that movie is all about people trying to somehow hear from God or reach God. And his conclusion in all of this was that we don't hear any voices outside this universe. We only hear from uh, one another. So has God spoken? That continues to be the issue. Well, the, the Old Testament, New Testament would say he has. I want us to reread a few passages that that claim divine authorship. And perhaps I want us to, to read it in a fresh new way. And I want you to look for those phrases that say, the Lord said, or any that are equivalent. For example, Exodus 20, verses 1 through 3. Then God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land, out of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other God are God's before me. Then God spoke, it says, in Exodus chapter 7, verses 1 and 2. Then the Lord said to Moses, See, I make you as God to Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron shall be your prophet. You shall speak all that I, what? Commanded, command you. And your brother Aaron shall speak to Pharaoh, that he let the sons of Israel go out of his land. Deuteronomy 8. He humbled you and let you be hungry and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you understand, now watch this, that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by everything that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. If we live by everything that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord, does it not preclude that God has to speak? Yes. The New Testament writers had the same ring about what they said. Uh, in fact, God even spoke verbally at the baptism of Jesus, at the transfiguration, and even in the Garden of Eden when Jesus said, Lord, you be glorified. God spoke back to him. God the Father spoke back to him. He says, I have been glorified and I will be glorified. And if you systematically... Page through the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, you will find over 1,500 statements that speak of God speaking directly to man. What about the unity of the Bible? Does it give us any evidence for divine authorship? Josh McDowell, I don't know if you've ever heard of him. Josh McDowell was with Campus Crusade for Christ. He's another fine graduate of Talbot Seminary. That's just a plug. Uh, Josh McDowell has spoken to thousands and thousands of, of college students. And he tells a story about the time he ran into a representative of the uh, great books of the Western world. Those volumes contain great statements of thought from those who really brought in the new civilization, going all the way back to Greek philosophers and up to our time. And so Josh McDowell said to this representative, he said, let me ask you a question. If you take writers in those books, 
all from the same time period, from the same place, who speak the same language, and you gave them a controversial problem, would they all agree? <laughs> he said no. It would be all over the map, essentially, is what he said. Now, keep that in mind when you consider that the Bible is written by 40 different authors, all from different walks of life. Some priests, some kings, some herdsmen, some legislators, some fishermen, prophets. We go on and on. They lived in diverse cultures, wrote in a variety of literary styles. But the message from Genesis to Revelation is one great drama of God's redemption. From paradise lost in the garden to paradise regained in the book of Revelation, it is all one message that fits together in agreement. You might say that the Bible is a lot like the body. An organ, such as the liver, has no purpose or meaning outside that body. Say the same for a lung or, a liver or, or, or kidneys or anything else. See, the Bible fits together and it makes one complete organ that makes sense. And it explains to us God's dramatic plan to redeem man from his sin. And through it all, from Genesis, Genesis to Revelation, you've heard me say this many times, it is all about the glory of God. That's, it's, it's complete, and you read that all throughout the Scripture. Now, there's a decision you cannot avoid if this is true. It's a decision you can't avoid. What does it mean to you? Is, is this book um, kind of like a suitcase? We carry it along. We look pretty good. We look like we're doing the right thing. And, you know, and, and, and we, it, it, it speaks to us when we want it to speak to us, when it's convenient. Or is it the authority of our lives? I uh, pay a little bit of attention to the, 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 the weather channel. And... Um, and when I go online to look at the weather, I don't want to just read about what it says is going to happen. I want the big picture. I want to know everything about it. So what I do is I go to the radar. And I learned a little bit about weather back in high school. And so I know some things. I want to see where that, that band of clouds, where it's tracking. I want to know where it is. I know exactly where it's going if I can just know where it is. The Bible is our radar, folks, that tells us where we're going. It tells us where the bad places are and where we shouldn't be. So is it our authority or is it just something that we will agree with when we agree with, we'll obey it when we want to obey it, when it's convenient, or we won't? But it makes sense to me. If it's God's word, we should obey it. And if you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, the thing that it says first and foremost is that Christ came and took on flesh and died for each of us. It's not about joining a church. It's not about living a good life. It's not even about knowing the Bible. It's about whether I have accepted Christ as my Savior. And it could very well be that you've been in the church all of your life. Listen, I grew up in a, in a uh, and went to school in college I grew up in a Baptist church until I got into a Bible church and I went to college at a Baptist school and I found there were many people there that they had grown up in the same environment but they didn't know the Christ. My roommate was one of them. And so it's possible that you can know a lot about Christ and know his word and truly not seen Christ in your place on the cross and trusted him as your savior. Be sure, be sure because if this word is written by God, there's no other decision to be made. Let's 
pray.